Lawrence here, and I really am just so uh, heartwarmed that the room is full. You never know with these things, you know, that there's going to be uh, anybody here, and everybody shows up. And it's such a great uh, thing to be able to talk about love. Susanna, by the way, I want to say thank you to Susanna. She is um, um, here voluntarily with BCACC, uh, BC Clinical Counselors Association, and she's one of the coordinators that's inviting uh, people to come and speak, and to me being one of those people. So uh, thank you, Susanna. You're very welcome. And I'm, I'm uh, speaking into a mic so that she can pick this up with her team. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for coming, and um, you'll notice on your seat, oh, I should say, by the way, I'm Joanne Weiler. That would be a good start. <laughs> <laughs> and I always get a little bit nervous before I start these things, and then once I get going, I'm fine. Um, so help me out here. First, before we start, I just want to check in with everybody that's here, and it's also helpful for me to ground for that. So I just want you to notice that you're sitting in a chair right now, and just notice your bum on the chair and how it feels. Hey, Julie, there's some spots up here. Um, and I want you just to notice your hands and how your hands are feeling right now. Are they warm? Are they cool? Tingly? And I just want you to notice your back and how your back is feeling sitting in the chair. And let's just take a deep breath in. Do you know that just by breathing, you stimulate um, part of your brain that actually calms you down. So I'm going to take a deep breath in with you. Breathe in and breathe out. Yeah, good. So um, welcome tonight. It's really nice to have everybody here. And I hope to share some ideas with you about love. And uh, it's interesting today, um, I had permission to, with my client to mention this story to you. To share the story, uh, she had some um, homework to go out and sign herself up on a dating site. She is, has been single for a year. It's time. Uh, her husband had passed away a year prior, and uh, it was really time for her to kind of make a move and just get herself into the uh, dating world, and she thought that that would be a great way to start. And so she took this upon her to you know, get out there, and she signed up for one of the dating websites. And, um, and what happened is that, I guess, you know, she started getting these smiles and things like that. And she just noticed, you know, just a kind of a reservation in that she just was not ready to, to be on a dating site yet and not ready to kind of move forward. And we had a bit of a laugh about it because it was really telling for her and really enlightening to know that she's not there yet. She hasn't really got herself released from the grief of her um, uh, husband who had passed away. And that's why we're here. Whether you've gone through a separation, a divorce, or whether you are grieving somebody that you've lost in your life, it takes time and it takes really conscious uh, intention to kind of move through a process of the grief and that can take as long as it takes you. Uh, there's not one formula for it. You could say, let's say, uh, one month for every year you were together. You could make up your own formula, but there's no one formula for how long it will take you to move through uh, the grief process. But what you gotta know is that we all go through it because everyone in this room has gone through a breakup, probably a few breakups in their life, and if I asked you right now, how many breakups have you ever gone through, you'd probably tell me like 10, 12, you know. And so with every one of those breakups, your heart takes a, a bit of a hit. And what I want to help you with today is how do you kind of take those experiences and integrate learning about yourself? So what you're doing is you're actually incorporating a strength from having had the experience, focusing on you. And you can't just do that. You can't just like close the door and just say, I'm going to do that. It does take you know, conscious strategies to get there. So I want to help you with that tonight. I also want to keep this really informal, so please feel free to ask me questions. Uh, if there's things that are specific to you that you just want a little bit more information about, please feel free to do that. Really welcome that. So um, today is about learning to love again. My book, I wrote a book called Break Up Breakthrough and Learning to Love Again, and I'm going to have it republished. If anybody knows a publisher, <laughs> um, I'm going to republish it to say Learning to Love Again, because it's really about that. It's really how do we actually um, 
take the the pain and the you know the the hardness of of, um, of the breakup and actually incorporate strength and resiliency and expand our hearts. So that's what I'm going to help you with tonight. And so uh, let's. So what I want you to do, I ask you to fill out that slip of paper. Your two strengths. Take your first, your two strengths, just that one page. I want you to turn to the person beside you and tell them about those two strengths. Okay? Just to get started. So introduce yourself and just tell them your two strengths. It's supporting uh, kids getting education in Africa, that program, uh, Me to Weep. And, um, and so it's really, um, it is about that. It's also about the heart, right? This is about Me to we. We all go through these changes in our lives and relationships. And it's as we discover that there is something about me that's just like you, that it makes it safe to get out there and start um, you know, rediscovering love again. And it is until you kind of start to really connect with those parts of ourselves and realize that they are just exactly like the other person, maybe not exactly, but pretty much like that, that all of a sudden you start to feel comfortable in this world of ours. What happens though when you go through breakup, you get a ton of anxiety, right? And I want to tell you that uh, it's really interesting. Do you know that 33%, according to Brittany Brown's studies, uh, 33% of all people in this room have had some shaming experience about failure. 33%, it's incredibly high. And I mean, I can think of you know moments in my childhood where I felt that sense of failure. And, and it's quite common, I'm sure probably most people can sort of think of something. Well, 33% of you I know can. Think of something, a time in school where you really got shamed for failure. And I think that's part of why when a breakup happens, we go to a sense of failure and it makes it so darn tough because that stress that's, that happens from failure means that our, sh our heart shuts down, our whole bodies get into um, you know, a, a adrenaline rushes and uh, heart racing and panic and all of these things that you isolate and you do what we would do in a time of war, right? Because you're at war trying to kind of maintain your existence with all this failure about 
a breakup. And that's including whether or not um, you've actually had a loss as well. There's a, there's a bind in, if your partner passed away, the same sort of thing, right? It's like there's this bind in that, you know, it's not their fault they passed away, but what's happened is you're left, you know? So there's a real, it's, it's a tough thing that we really, until we kind of realize that there is that human connection with all of us and that we all go through these things, it kind of brings down our anxiety. And that's sort of, well, that is the most important first step in your process. Feel your grief, connect with others, talk about it just as you did right now. Talk about stuff because the more you talk, the more you will realize that connection and that safety and that, um, Grief of yours has a chance to actually process. So uh, here's the thing, it's really interesting. With the male and female brain, um, it's really, by the way, great to see guys in the room. Uh, yay. <laughs> uh, it's harder, grief is actually harder on that because of the way the brain processes one thing at a time. And so, you know, when you're in grief, you are really in grief and it feels really overwhelming. Whereas women actually have more uh, lateral access your brain has kind of uh, got a division, the corpus column, and there's like connections here. And what happens is that with women, you can actually integrate, um, you know, a whole sort of picture. But with men, when they're in grief, they are just really sunk in grief. It's harder because they are a one, they have one thought at a time. So, but in any case, but in talking, and the other thing too, women tend to talk more with each other. I, I imagine probably the guys that are in the room probably do talk they have got their guy friends and it's really nice to see. But lots of guys hold their, their, um, their fears and their um, experiences privately, whereas women tend to be naturally a little bit more social and the brain is actually a, a social uh, part of our body. It's very social. It need, we need each other. <laughs> we actually really do need each other. And so in talking, um, you'll find out that you can actually uh, learn in the experience of love, you can stay open, I like these acronyms because you'll remember this. Uh, you can value what you're going through and value yourself. And then, of course, the only way we get to enlightenment is actually through relationships, right, and learning by our, about ourselves. Because otherwise, um, you can't learn unless you've got a sort of some kind of uh, irritant, you know, somebody that's going to mirror back to you what's going on for them. So we only learn in relationship. It's really difficult to do that without actually having uh, the practice partner to work it through. So um, that's my acronym, love, learning, opening, valuing, and enlightening. And then guess what? This is going to be the end uh, result from today. You're going to fly forever loving you. Anyways, so moving along. That's where I'm taking you. Um, right. So, isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> so tonight I'm going to talk about three, I'm going to go through three different parts so you know where we're going, okay? We're on this journey together. Um, I've separated it in to close the door. How do you do that? Go through the grief process. And uh, then how do you learn about you so you're going into a sense of integrating wholeness again? And so, and then how do we get to when the new door opens and you are ready to love? And that's the fun part we're going to talk about. Dating, sex, intimacy, and all that good stuff. So, um, and, and envisioning your new life, uh, values-based, and uh, bringing out the best in you. So, um, so um, by the way, I just want to remind you that um, tonight, you, if um, you do volunteer like questions or things like that, Susanna is taping, she is, you're not on tape, okay, so that you know you're anonymous here, okay? Just want to let you know. Um, at first when this happens, as I mentioned, you have this uh, burst of anxiety and, uh, and basically, um, you know, all the feelings that you've got will feel sort of, you'll fluctuate at different stages and uh, different sort of feelings. They're all normal. You know, how many people here, um, how many people here have gone through a breakup in the last year or had a loss? Yeah, in the last year. Oh, mm. Welcome. <laughs> 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 uh, and how many have gone through one in the last three months? Okay. And the last month? Okay, welcome. And in the last two years? Within the last two years? Yeah, okay. Nice to have you here. And um, 
well, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. <laughs> um, and I have to say, my husband, of, um, we just celebrated uh, eight years of marriage uh, in August, so he's here tonight, so nice to have you here, Joe. <laughs> anyway, so it's all normal, and I think that's part of it, you know, as I mentioned, talking to others, you'll discover that, you know, we all go through this, we've all gone through, if you count from childhood to now, you're going to have lots of breakups, and probably maybe a few more. Uh, so let's get good at them. First of all, uh, how do you close the door? And I put flowers there, because we've all kind of woken up in the morning with those swollen eyes, and you can't see out of your eyes, anybody? Yeah, not. <laughs> Well, anyways, how do you kind of reframe that? First, you've got to, um, first of all, clear the reminders that are giving you the, you know, the constant pulling back to what was and the longing, and actually go through a, a, a conscious process of grieving. So the first part is, you know, writing out, I've got an exercise called the three R's, and I really recommend. So what you do is you look at what are your best parts of the relationship, because you have dedicated a certain amount of time to your relationship and that's precious time and it's it's not been all bad right you want to be able to hold on to that time so you go through your remembrances and think about the things that that you really appreciate about your time together and um, and that's really an important part of it so that you don't kind of um, have a sense that you're just going to cut off from that part of your life because all of that is actually feeding you and who you are today if you can have that ease but if you're staying stuck in resentment, um, which is also important to write out, the second R is resentment. You need to write out your resentments. Like, what do you really resent about your partner and the way that they let you down? And write a list, and you know, just and you may have to do this a bunch of times, and share it with a friend, and even ideally share it with your former partner. So when you go through that, you have a sense of closure. One of the hardest things is actually feeling complete in an uh, ending relationship. And until you actually feel complete in the relationship, it's hard not to drag these uh, histories along and, and be fearful of trusting again. And so writing out a list of resentments, you just let yourself just write it off the page, or a few pages. Um, and, and, then, um, and then regrets are really important as well to write out the things that you really regret about how you showed up in the relationship. We've, we're all in a process of getting better, you know, and we want to approach life in that attitude. I would not profess, I mean, this is my career, this is what I do, but I don't know it all. <laughs> For sure, I'm learning still. Um, in the Buddhist uh, faith, they say that if you see uh, the Buddha, you should stomp on him, because you don't want to ever feel that you've actually arrived. You want to continue to learn throughout your lifetime. And uh, if you're not learning, why be here, you know? So, um, and in fact, um, it's interesting, you know, the, this research that was done on rats um, were quite similar. And um, anyway, they had um, a pad, uh, um, you know, on this table, and they had, they released this rat to a food source. Has anybody heard this research before? They, they released this rat to this food source and there was an electric shock pad that was over by where the food was and uh, they shocked the rat. Well, just one shock. The rat would not come back to the food source ever. Um, and so they tried to coax the rat to come back to the food source with like uh, even cocaine to get this rat to come and eat from this food source. It would not go there, even having been shocked just one time. And the only thing that would bring it back to eat food, because they turned the, sh the uh, pad off, the only thing that brought it back was another rat. So ha letting another rat go out and see that the rat eat from the food source and not be shocked, then it would actually trust to go back to the food source. And it's telling for us about relationships, right? That it is only through relationships that we can learn to uh, recover from loss of trust or heal from pain. And actually, um, it's in the relationship that we learn how to be again. So loss of trust in ourselves or in someone else, loss of, um, so it's having that experience. Um, and so relationships is, is it. I'm telling you, you're gonna have to get there. <laughs> but you can't just get there and it does take time. So doing those lists, sharing it with your partner is a really good approach to have. And if that's not possible, 
I would really recommend to write letters, you know, that you're not going to send. Um, you can write letters. Did anybody ever see Message in a Bottle? Mm -hmm. I love that movie. It's so dear. And um, if you haven't seen it, it's about a man who's grieving his, the loss of his wife who passed away, and he just can't uh, approach life again. And he writes letters to his wife, and he throws them off in a bottle, and these bottles get found, and becomes the storyline of his healing. And it's such a lovely uh, thing, actually. And I, you know, it's kind of a nice thing. But um, with my client this morning, I suggested she write a um, letters to her former husband. And um, and you know every morning you know just write a story about what's going on what she's feeling just little things and after a while she'll probably notice that she's not writing them anymore she's forgotten for a week and so you can grieve even when you haven't had the when you don't have the person with you if they passed away and they're you know not in physical form anymore you can still go through that grief process or if you know your partner former partner is unwilling to meet you at the table to talk about what's going on, that's a way that you can get around that. So, but writing is really helpful. And then actually sharing with a friend or talking to somebody or seeing a counselor is a, a great option, a um, great way to go as well. So, um, so get your supports, uh, you know, right away, like as much as you can. I mean, the inclination will be to isolate yourself. It, um, it, whenever we feel pain, we naturally close up and uh, withdraw and you have to fight that impulse because it's just uh, it's it's then it's your you know your self-talk and all the negativity and the resentment will take over and you won't be able to move yourself through any other kind of perspective except for just immersing in this uh, dark place and so get your support so because they can actually hold you accountable they can also hold you they can also be just reflective with you and uh, hearing your story and validating. They've known you through time, you know, and they love you. So it just, it's a sense of constancy. Your family as well, um, you know, just having them around you as much as possible will really help as well. And uh, so, and, you know, I've put down, change your Facebook status. It's funny how we've got to kind of keep track of like media, social media now. It's, and, you know, how many times you have like single or, you know, together or whatever. Anyway. Um, all of those things are important too, and um, you know, if you find yourself wanting to sort of check up, you know, secretly, what is your partner doing? Just don't go there. <laughs> that, that's actually quite typical too. Does anybody relate to that? Totally. totally. <laughs> yeah. So just you know, um, really manage yourself, and you can actually move through this. Yeah. Is anybody have any questions so far? Did yeah. you review the three R's? I missed yes. the first one. So remembrances, I'm always, a, I'm a big believer in start with a positive. So, and forcing yourself to write a list of remembrances. I know that's hard to do. And I mean, some of you are going to go, there are no <laughs> good things about our time together. And that's so natural and normal. But really, you know, kind of go through your photo album and really train yourself into remembering that. Because that softening will be really important and healthy for you. As you'll find out later in the presentation, it puts your body in a much healthier state that stress and anxiety of maintaining the poison, really, uh, is a deficit to you and to everybody else around you. And so you really are encouraged by that first part, the remembrances, because you'll naturally go to good you know, memories and hold that. And then regrets are the things that are about me, like what I wish I had done differently. There's always, you should have at least 10 things on the page. <laughs> And then, um, let me see, remembrances, regrets, and uh, resentments. Resentments. resentments, thank you. I even have a hard time saying that. It's hard to resent. <laughs> you can tell I'm a sunny side up person. <laughs> um, anyway, but resentments are important too. You've got to get that anger out, right? It's otherwise going to, um, you know, turn up this anxiety. Um, you've heard that before, and then anxiety leads to depression, right? So you really do want to get those uh, resentments out as well. And whether you actually let that person know, or whether you just keep it to yourself or share it with a friend, that's, you know, just, that's all good. Okay, so the three R's. Yes. Um, yeah, but the truth is, actually, it's true. I, and, and a girlfriend said to me, and we're 
jogging along the seawall, she said to me, but you know, the truth is, we all want to find somebody, and I think that is absolutely true. We are social beings, our brain is social, we're meant to be, uh, you know, in partnership. But before we can actually get there to be in healthy partnership, we've really got to heal ourselves and really have that whole self that we're coming back to uh, a new relationship. Otherwise, you'll just be dragging along this big bag of resentments that you've never actually processed and grieved from, and you'll be bonking that next person over the head with those resentments, you know, because the the tendency is, it's, it's a trauma, really, you know, going through a breakup, really, it's a bit of a trauma, and, and, and uh, if you notice yourself very reactive with other people, that's because you haven't processed the trauma. So, anyway, that's important. Um, so, you know, it's like Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. It is like that. You do go through these stages, and there's a sliding back and forth, and you may find yourself, you know, some days feeling like, okay, I get this, it's fine, I'm moving on, I feel good, and then you'll next day wake up and feel just like crap, and, you know, really angry, and you're not really sure why. Has anybody noticed a sliding back and forth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody want to say anything about that? Two steps forward, one step back. Yeah, snakes and ladders, I always say. I love that game, right? It's like, yeah. Yeah, and how do you handle the, uh, the slide back down? I allow myself to feel it, and welcome it, and then just move on to the next day. Yeah, nice. And, yeah, just being in acceptance with it. That's Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Anybody else? What do you do when you slide back down? You're kind of moving forward. Things are... You think that um, you're kind of through it, and then you have that slide back down. Okay. Like go running. <laughs> it's kind of like running. We go running, running. Go running, yeah. Like exercises. Yeah, the best. Yeah. Um, okay. So. So then there are those times when you think, okay, I really have got to kind of like turn inward and get myself, you know, back on track. I've got to ground myself. And so here's just some tools that are just a great way to go. Tapping. Um, oxytocin, by the way, is one of the best uh, discoveries in the last, um, I don't know, five or so years, but it's really become very important. And oxytocin is the attachment hormone uh, that is produced for breastfeeding for women and for dilating um, for deliveries, but men actually produce it as well, although I've never... You, probably have a delivered baby, but um, <laughs> but you do produce oxytocin. And, um, and so oxytocin is the attachment hormone that makes you feel secure and confident and calm. And um, it's interesting, there's a gal by the name of, um, hmm, I can't remember her name now. Anyways, I can tell you that later. Um, but she did a research project on um, people who she gave oxytocin through a nasal spray and Carlisle is her name. And um, she did this research project on people um, and she gave them a nasal spray of oxytocin and what she found is their ability to go, to become more trusting um, went up by 30%. So the oxytocin hormone will help you start to heal. It also helps reduce the anxiety that actually is kind of a repellent, you know, it's, it kind of keeps people away. So, you know, we know this by research, and so you can actually produce oxytocin um, tapping. So I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So I'm going to put this down. And um, I'm going to get you to, you know, put your hands on your knees, okay? And the oxytocin is actually produced through your skin. So um, it's activated by your skin through a hug, uh, through sex. And, you know, sadly, when you're you know, single, that's not happening all that much, right? So we got to look at other things. Massages produces oxytocin. Anyway, hands on your legs here. And I just want you to alternate tapping, alternate tapping pretty firmly on your legs. Keep the tapping light. And I know it, it's a workout for your forearms. <laughs> Hang in there. It will work out. Okay, now hold your hands in place. And just, you'll feel a kind of like warm sensation through your legs. Do you feel it? Mm -hmm. Almost like a little buzzing in your hands. That's oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Cool, huh? <laughs> and guess what? You're a little bit calmer. <laughs> <laughs> Another way you can do it is with your hands across your chest and the same sort of thing, alternate tapping. This is a great thing for anxiety. Uh, it's really a, a great way to kind of bring your anxiety down. Just alternate tapping and you 
you know, just keep the tapping going, and then, um, and then just hold your hands there, and you'll feel that kind of warm feeling through your chest and, you know, even up into your face. Um, and so, um, yeah, oxytocin. It's all about oxytocin. Uh, the next thing is thought field therapy. You can look up online, but it's based on seven meridians of your body. You can do this tapping. I'm not going to go through it all right now, but it's something maybe to look up online if you wanted to learn how to do that. Basically tapping here, here, there, there, uh, outside of your hand, and then pressing here. But anyway, you can look that up. Um, and meditation is, you know, we, we know now that vitamin D is one of the things that's going to keep you cancer-free and healthy through your life. It's yeah, absolutely, if there's one thing you take in a vitamin, it's vitamin D. And we also know now, uh, through science, that meditation is just like that. I mean, we used to think that meditation was sort of that fringe thing for, you know, the hippie culture or something. Now, meditation is, like, so important and probably should be part of every day. The way we wake up, the way we go to sleep, meditate a little bit. And when you do that, you lengthen telomeres in your body so that you actually can handle stress better. So, you know, and meditation is not uh, complicated. It's just, you know, breathing. And you, know, you can just do it by simply breathing. We did a bit of a mindful meditation at the beginning of the session today, thinking about you know, how your hands feel. Um, you can actually just go top to bottom, do a meditation, and just you know close your eyes and turn inward. Um, DanSiegel.com, if you look his um, website up, he's got a wheel of awareness that I would totally recommend. It's a wonderful meditation. It'll take you through sort of these hubs of awareness, and uh, it's a wonderful way to meditate as well. So meditation, aromatherapy um, is really um, very mainstream as well now. Uh, we know now that aromatherapy really does make a difference. What happens is with aromatherapy, it actually connects to the limbic brain, it bypasses the anterior lobe, so you actually get an immediate fix on calming yourself down. So lavender, yiling lang, um, we have a massage therapist here tonight. Sandy, do you want to say, is there other, are there special ones that you'd recommend? Um, well, first I'd recommend Young Living Oils. Um, they're the best oils that I've ever come across, and you can get them online. They're really good because they're pure. They have no um, alcohol resins in them or anything. They're made um, strictly from the plant itself, and they're the best. So anyway, make a stop to um, you know get yourself some if you you know so inclined you might want to pick up some of those things. Um, and running is you know running or hiking or something that gives you 20 minutes of cardio is a really good way to kind of get your brain right. Um, so we just you were saying about running, it's, it was absolutely something that was totally life saving for me actually um, in my, the process of my own breakup. Yeah, and you're going yeah. <laughs> I know, it's, it, it, you know, anything that is going to give you some cardio, so it could be cycling, anything that gets you sweating um, is, is what you want to do for 20 minutes. And, um, you know, talking to your friends, I mentioned, get some therapy, um, a massage is a great way to go. Uh, yeah, the other thing too is, it's interesting, like, um, you use sociality is, the sense that we are meant to be in groups, you know, so as much as you can, try to join some groups. Being a part of a group like the North Shore Athletics, uh, if you're living on the North Shore, is a really uh, great running group. Uh, you might join, um, you know, and it really doesn't cost much, right? I mean, it's just, or come to here to the community center where you can go to a community fitness for $6, I think it is. So, you know, there's definitely, um, you know, there's just so many avenues, and in that way, you're naturally doing the things that you like to do. You're going to meet other people, and so, and it is really refreshing to meet new people as well. Putting yourself in new situations gives you a chance, like a break from the grief. You know, sometimes you might not want to talk about, you know, the three R's. You know, <laughs> just want to be me for an hour, and so going to a group situation can really be helpful. Um, I just, a time with your family. Do you know there's research that says that just, if you've got kids, has anybody here got kids? Yeah. 
Me too. Do you know that just being in the um, presence of your children actually changes your brain in a positive way? And so, um, <laughs> no matter what change your kids are on, uh, it, it, it does. So, you know, spend time with your kids. And it's interesting, you know, oftentimes what I see is some people are so wanting to, you know, get on the hunt to meet somebody, they're actually out there kind of trying to meet somebody rather than actually really healing and being with your kids, which the better, the more time you spend with the kids, the better you are and the better your kids are. So we want to work on the whole system, right? And, and move gradually, steadily ahead. And in that way, everybody is doing a lot better. But just the physical uh, presence of your kids actually has a positive uh, impact to your brain. So interesting. And journal, I'm a firm believer in journaling. I, you know, it doesn't, and a lot of people, any, if you've got kind of performance anxiety, you might be afraid to put things on the page. Does anybody relate to that? Like, what can I write? <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, you, you kind of have this journal, you, you might tear off the first five pages thinking, oh, I can't write that. And that's really, it's really helpful even just to notice that. But this is your best friend, your journal. You could write anything. You saw Bridget Jones' diary? <laughs> Do you remember that scene when she's written her uh, journal and all through the, you know, angry times and everything like that? She's put everything down there and then her boyfriend of choice and the end, this lovely man, grabs her journal and she thinks he, she's being discovered for all the like, you know, slagging she's done in the journal, and he goes to buy her a new journal. But anyways, journaling is a great thing for men and women. It's, I would just absolutely recommend it. Um, and when you journal, write on the one side what you're feeling today, and then come back and leave the right side of the page blank, and then come back to it a week later and see how your feelings about that thing has changed. Because that's really interesting too. It's helpful if you tend to get anxiety, to get that perspective, you'll start to realize like, wow, I really was so worried about that thing and now it's such not a non-issue for me. And so little by little, you're actually training yourself to not sweat the small stuff and, uh, or maybe pay attention to the small stuff. So get yourself in shape. Um, the, the biggest thing that happens when you're, you know, just out of a relationship is that the sense of not having control Anybody feel like a lack of control? <laughs> yeah. And so um, what you do for your body, you really do have control of, and you're really going to get the results from. So it's kind of like cleaning out a drawer is really helpful too. But, um, but getting yourself in shape and sort of focusing on your fitness is something you're going to totally get return on. And then your brain starts to realize, like, I really do have control. And then the healing again, the less anxiety, the better you're, you're going to do. So, um, and when you're there, keep your head up and meet some people. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so, yes. <laughs> How many people have trouble with anger? <laughs> I know, you know, whether you have trouble hearing it or expressing it, it's not the, the, the emotion of choice for any of us. But in fact, anger is a really intimate part of our emotional world. And we've got to get good at it, like good at it, being able to express it and also receive it as long as it's not, you know, said in, you know, you're bonking your partner or you're bonking somebody else with it. You're actually saying it in a way that is um, expressing a vulnerability that's underneath anger. And um, I love Thich Nhat Hanh's, um, metaphor that you could think of anger like a crying child and um, as a crying child um, is in front of you you would actually not probably mini lecture the crying child you wouldn't tell the child not to cry or that it you know all the reasons why it's not reasonable to be crying and you wouldn't throw the child against the wall and you wouldn't walk away from the child you know what you would do is you would actually hold the child and so we should think of anger in that same way, to hold it, to sort of really, it's not like you can go up to somebody when they're angry and go, oh, but let me give you a hug. <laughs> I get it. Or that you can do that as well. But you know, it, what I mean is emotionally embrace it, hold it. Um, I've got a diagram at the front there, and it's really, um, you know, my, um, my diagram is actually, one of the reasons that we get so um, stuck on this process of anger is that um, when we're growing up, 
we're trained into being subjective about who we are. So we're only as good as our teachers tell us. We get an A, we're brilliant, we get a D, we're a failure. And um, all of that, you know, again, you know, you've got friends, you're in, if you've got a good hair day, you're beautiful, if you um, do well at sports, you're athletic, you know, and all of these things are so subjective, and so our brain and thinking is really trained into the subjective world. And so, you know, everything coming from the outside in, you're in a very vulnerable situation, because if the information coming in is negative, guess what, there's a hole in your heart. And so what happens is that you're really stuck in this, um, this sense of like, I don't want, I don't want to be wrong, right? And I'm going to really react. And so what happens if somebody is critical and angry with you, you think, you know, oh God, I'm an amoeba. You can't even hear the person because you're in an anxiety state. This is where you're at. And so you're on this roller coaster ride with in relationships, like when someone's angry with you, you are down here feeling just awful about yourself. And here, when you feel, when they're like happy with you and they think you're wonderful, then you feel wonderful. But this kind of thing is, is gonna wear out any relationship and it'll definitely wear you out. So that sense of riding the roller coaster is the sense that we're building ourselves based on others. Whereas what you wanna do is start to think of yourself from an internal place. And so checking in with your body, how do I feel uh, in the you know context of this other person? And if somebody's angry with me, I want to be empathic with their, you know, their experience, but not take it so personally. Yes, I can consider if there's something for me to really be thinking about here that I need to get better at, because I told you before, I'm a perfect, I'm getting better, <laughs> hopefully all my life. Um, and, but, I, but I'm not going to go on the roller coaster ride with the person. So I can actually say, wow, that's really hard. I can see how that was really upsetting for you and at the same time not be on that roller coaster to prove that person wrong. Um, and so what I suggest is to say to yourself, am I defending myself? Then you've got big time anger and you guys, uh, you know, uh, it's exhausting. <laughs> and you're at risk. Um, or am I defining myself? If I'm defining myself, I'm up here. Well, I would say something like, um, it's really hard to hear that right now. I could see I've really let you down, and I could see how upset you are. Tell me more about it. So I'm going to define, like, it feels hard to hear this right now, but I really want to hear what's going on for you. And that changes everything, because the person kind of feels, oh, OK, so I, I matter to you. So even though this thing has happened, you actually want to hear about it. And guess what? It heals. You know, So your experience, you're building an attachment with the person. And, and the relationship can deepen. Because anger is actually really intimate. It's just that um, you know our ancestors used to use clubs and things when they got angry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just not OK. <laughs> but you know, if, we're, if we're kind of thinking in this, in this way, it really does change things, right? And so um, in, actually fa in actual fact, you'll find yourself feeling you know, a greater sense of love for the person. And um, so, so being right, you know, being invested in being right, you absolutely <laughs> lose. But you know, if you actually sort of start to ask questions, you'll start to realize um, a, a lot more intimate, deeper relationship with the other person. And uh, you need to figure this out, or else you're just going to repeat this pattern in your next relationship. So you've got to get a mastery in anger. <laughs> I would recommend everybody work at it. You know, just experience it, uh, express it do your resentments, uh, and really hear the way you've let the other person down. Really hear it. Try to be present for that. And so um, the other thing is that um, anger, people who are internal processors tend to be uh, more um, predisposed to uh, anxiety and sort of holding anger in. And people who are external processors t tend to be um, damaging sometimes um, because they'll just be saying whatever's on their mind. So you really want to learn how to self-regulate. So self-regulation means that I'm actually a master of myself, of my emotion. So I want to kind of do like five big breaths before I say anything, right? So just take a deep breath and breathe out, right? I can do that five times or I might do the tapping exercise that we did. That would be another great way to regulate. And then after, come back to the conversation, but ask yourself first, like, what just happened to me? Like, 
why am I upset? What's important about this thing that happened? And then express it from like I. You know, I really felt um, let down when blah, blah, blah. But anyway, you need to practice these things, otherwise it is gonna repeat the next time around. So there definitely are healthier ways vulnerability I was talking about, you know, it's just, it feels like you have, you know, failed. So, of course, you don't want to, you want to be right. <laughs> and that's what it kind of looks like energetically. It's just pushing. It's like you're pushing a wall, which is just so um, unhealthy for you and unhealthy for the other person. So, it's just, yeah, food for thought. Next thing that happens, anybody feel guilty? <laughs> yeah? Tell me about guilt. Somebody, come on. Sorry. Hey. I have a very guilty complex personality. I just feel Catholic? Were you Catholic? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Catholic? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
feeling uh, and emotion that kind of sucks, actually. Because <laughs> when you feel guilty, it just brings your all your energy, your creativity goes down because you are in a negative um, frame. So you really want to kind of process that and work through it. And um, so, yeah, again, there are differences in the male and the female brain and how you process guilt, too, right? Again, that one thing at a time process for the male brain and as opposed to the lateral thinking for female brain. So it's really, it really is important to talk about it. And um, yeah, sorry, I, it's 85% <laughs> of all men and women. I, I said 33, I think, yeah. before. Wait a minute. So 85% of all men and women have had some shaming experiences of failing in, in childhood. Sorry, Brittany Brown. Anyway, so uh, yeah, 85% of us, yeah, that actually sounds way more. Yeah. And I tend to usually exaggerate, so what's <laughs> happening? Um, yeah, so 85% of us, you know, and so that's also where shame comes from. It's I shouldn't have failed. I, you know, I'm, you know, really? Of course I'm going to fail. It's the only way I get better at things and the only, only way I get better at life. And so from a young child on, you know, life is about a discovery. We're going to screw up. And it's the only way we can learn is actually making those mistakes. So why aren't we talking about it? Anyway, tools to move forward. Have closure with your former partner. One of the hardest things is actually staying in the conversation <coughs> until you both feel complete. Sometimes one person feels complete and the other one doesn't. So make sure you actually have that line, like in a conversation at the end of it, say, I am complete. And, and, and listen to your partner say, I am complete. Try to get that closure because otherwise what you haven't processed is going to really drag along behind you into the next relationship and it just makes you complicated. You know, you'll just be on guard for that happening again with the next person. You'll probably choose some of the same uh, kinds of, of, of traits in the next person so you can kind of work it out and that's just a lot of hard work and pain. And if we're smart and if we go through this, we actually can integrate um, and get better. So, um, and you can use a, a journal, a list as well to move forward. If you're really stuck in that last frame of guilt, you know, use a, your journal to write out a list of all your rational beliefs about all these negative things about yourself, and then force yourself to write down in the next list the opposite and how you're getting better at that thing. So you're actually taking the, the, the things that you feel you didn't do well and doing something about it rather than just feel terrible about it. Just get better at that thing. You know, whatever it was that you failed at before, then just become expert at that now. So that's going to become your strength. What are the percentages of that you can have closure with your partner? Because most men, when it's over, that's closure for them. They don't yeah. want to discuss all that. So what are the chances <laughs> of having ring, closure? Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and, and you know what? I think that's really changing. And I think some women as well just won't have closure either. Like that, it's actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, you can only do, as I say, if the person's not up to have closure with you, then I would really recommend that you journal, write letters, you know, do the message in the bottle kind of thing, you know, create a ritual for yourself so you can actually, you know, or talk to your friends or see a counselor, like anything like that to kind of process it. Um, but, yeah, don't just leave it at that. Yeah. And take your time, right? There's lots of time in life, right? You don't have to re-engage with the next partner right away, take your time, pace yourself. So you really understand what went wrong, right? Uh, you know, everybody uses that phrase, what, uh, water under the bridge. It's all water under the bridge. Yeah, but you can actually learn quite a bit in that water. <laughs>